Good morning. You might remember that over the summer, I preached about King Solomon for a few weeks. King Solomon was King David's son. He was the one who built the temple that David was not allowed to build. Before the temple, the people offered sacrifices to God at the tabernacle, the tent where God would dwell. In both the tabernacle and the temple, the holiest area held the Ark of the Covenant. A box, a very fancy box, gold laid with cherubim on it. Statues, not real cherubim. But inside that box, there were stone tablets bearing the commandments that Moses had received on Mount Sinai. King Solomon's stories tell of the splendor of the first temple, his great wisdom, wealth surpassing that of any king before or since. His stories say that he was visited by dignitaries from the entire world. This is the story that God's people told of who they had been. Because you see, by the time the stories were actually written down, they were a ragamuffin sort of nation. King Solomon was a legend who may never have existed, much like his temple. The group of people known as the nation of Israel was small. And that nation was surrounded by larger tribes and larger cities. Most everyone around them had more sophisticated technology. We use the word Philistine to describe someone who is uneducated, hostile to arts and culture even. But the truth is, the Philistines were the most sophisticated of the tribes that were residing in what we call the Holy Land. The Philistines were sailors conquering the seas while the Israelites stay far away and tell stories of sea monsters. The artwork of the Philistines shows fish and sailing and their considerable wealth. The Israelites, on the other hand, settled in the land and spent a lot of time trying to become a kingdom like those around them. But they were always a little small, a little in danger. And as powers rose around them, they began paying money to the other kings to keep their own kingdom intact. By the time the nation of Babylon was in power in the land, the system wouldn't hold. Babylon ruled them first more gently, then more strongly, sending the people into exile in 586 BCE. I mention the exile from time to time because it is a significant event in the Bible and in the life of Judaism and in the understanding of the covenant that Israel held with God. This point in history, the point of exile, is actually a point in history. The beginning of a biblical record that is attested beyond the Bible. But it also marks the point that a nation of their own ceases to exist. What had been was destroyed. Out of the sadness of those events, it becomes not just a time of exile, but a time of prophets. Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah all write and prophesy out of this catastrophic shift in identity. It turns out that as the Babylonians are taking over, God begins speaking more, not less. The people who hear are no longer people in a place, but they remain at God's people just the same. Even as their homes and their place of worship are destroyed, God strengthens the covenant. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors, says God. The covenant I made when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant they broke. But this is the covenant 
that I will make with the house of Israel. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. God echoes that promise many, many, made many, many times before reminding them, I will be your God and you will be my people. That temple, the one which once held God's law within it, safely kept in the place where a priest entered only once a year, was gone. The legendary ark and the tablets disappeared too in the destruction of the temple. And instead of new tablets, God assures the people that they will have the word engraved on their hearts instead. What was once engraved in stone is now there just the same, still accessible, still part of their identity, even without a temple. In fact, that law, when it is engraved on their hearts, might be even more accessible, carried with them instead of hidden away in an ark. God keeps the promise that God makes. God keeps the promise of a bow in the sky, the promise of a people called into covenant with God, the promise of the commandments given, the promise of the way forward in that snake on a pole, and promises again that these promises hold, temple or not, building or not. So maybe that all feels too nail on the head as we move forward with plans to sell our building. These texts were chosen before that was even on the table the way that it is now. But it might actually be quite helpful that a chunk of the Bible is all about God's people being displaced and finding a way forward. During that season, as the exile was beginning, the Torah the name for the first five books of the Bible becomes central to the people's faith instead of the temple. This time of exile is when the collection of books that we call the Old Testament starts to have canonical form. Some books in, some books out, recorded in a specific order. The Israelites start figuring out what it means to keep the law when there cannot be sacrifices at the temple or many of the other acts of worship that are prescribed in the Torah. And so it is true that the synagogue becomes the focus of worship, not the temple. And it remains that way even through the building and destruction of the second temple. We have stories of Jesus in the temple, yes, but Jesus taught in synagogues too, remember, and read from the scrolls in the synagogues and was kicked out of the synagogues. See, Jesus inherited a Judaism born out of a people who had to figure out their covenant with God, even when there was no temple. You see, even, even in the time of Jesus, most Jews would have never worshipped at the temple especially not with any regularity, maybe only journeying for holy days. Even when they were permitted to return, most of the people chose to stay spread out over the empire instead of returning to Jerusalem. Now, of course, those people built synagogues where they were. They found other ways to gather, but their synagogues are much closer to our idea of a church building. It is something that is holy because God's people choose to worship and do God's work there, not because God dwells there. It is an intermingling of things both holy and ordinary. Now, there is never a time 
I am so aware of the mingling of those things, both holy and ordinary, as on I Help Weekends. It looks really different right now, but for most of the time of I Help, we've gathered on Saturday evening. We spend time moving chairs and setting up tables and wiping down patio furniture. We cook food and buy food and bring it to leave. We pack lunches. We put out clothes and sample size hygiene products. We sit down and we eat with people who call our church, at least our building, home for the night. Sometimes our guests are really struggling. Sometimes they're working on getting it together. Some of them we find out have bachelor's degrees. Others didn't finish high school. And there are people just about everywhere in between. Some of those guests have been homeless several times and others are first time homeless people. Occasionally they'll ask for prayers. More often they'll ask for the Wi-Fi password. And then the next morning they pack up and they head out at about 8 a.m. They get to sleep in an hour later than they do the rest of the week. And they mop the floors and reset chairs and scrub the toilets and put tables away. I would usually bring them breakfast to eat while they were doing those things. And as soon as they left at 8 a.m., I would go into the sanctuary and straighten what they missed. I'd check bathrooms and put toilet paper on the rolls since we have toilet paper holders that no one seems to be able to figure out. If you arrived at church early, you might have been assigned that job, in fact. And then, especially during the cooler months without the air conditioning kicking on, when it was really cold and the heat had been kicking on, the last thing I would do is prop open the doors to let the sanctuary air out. People without homes tend to not smell the best, even with more chances to shower and wash clothes in a program like I Help than on their own. Some weeks the smell would linger much longer than others, even after I'd moved the sheets outside. When everyone would get there for worship, some signs of the people who had slept there the night before would linger. Dishes to be collected, sheets to be taken and washed, some extra food in the fridge. Now that sounds like a story about a building. And sure, it took place in a building. But it is a story of people who had God's word written on their hearts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Or maybe Matthew, I was hungry and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me for as often as you do it for the least of these siblings of mine. You have done it for me, Jesus says. Ours is not a story about a building. It is a story about who God has called us to be, what God has written on our hearts. And as we begin this journey together, I want you to especially consider what God has written on your heart, the loved people of God. Amen.